Good morning, it's Elisa James here coming in from sunny Queensland this Friday as a different time zone and place. As you can see, I'm in my mum's painting studio. Now today is slightly different. I haven't told anyone I'm going live today, so my apologies. But it's all about movie making and behind the scenes what happens. Now today I thought it might be really fun since our movie just came out less than a week ago now and it's streaming all over loads of different channels in the US. The movie is called A Christmas Keepsake. Now it's a beautiful family movie in the Hallmark type of tradition and it's running or rather run by the Gap channel which is the Great American Family channel. Now that channel very much like Hallmark is very wholesome, very beautiful, they do aesthetically pleasing gorgeous type of pictures and the storylines are very family friendly. So you're never going to find any debauchery or sex on the stairs or, you know, all these other things that you find in these crazy series and movies sometimes. This is one of those beautiful feel-good movies that the whole family can watch. It's absolutely beautiful. Now, I've just gotten to see it, see it myself for the very first time because here's the thing in movie making. When you're in it, it's piecemeal together out of sync. Now. I've done a lot of acting and performance all my life, but movie making is very a specific type of art. And I wanted to take you few, a thing, a few, through a few things today to really show you how it all unfolds. It's really amazing and magical. We see on the screen this particular beautiful story emerging, right? So if you look up A Christmas Keepsake and you watch the movie, hopefully you'll be able to see it on the Great American Family channel or the Hallmark channel or Hulu, one of those streaming channels, when you watch it, it's, it's aesthetically beautiful to watch. It's just a lovely feel-good movie. But the thing is, when we were shooting it, and especially for me as a, as a, new, a newbie actor to movies, it was really interesting the way it was all done out of sync. So at the time, the storytelling wasn't there for me during the process. So that was really interesting within itself. So what I'd like to take you through is to introduce you to the concepts of movie making. Whether you like the movie or not is not the point here right now. The point is, how, as an actor, how does it feel to be on the other side of those cameras? Because when we're a, a watcher, an audience member, we can soak up all of that information that's coming to us from the screen, but we see it and feel it from a different perspective. We just follow the storyline. Now, as I said, whether you like it or not is, is beside the point. The whole point of, of it is it's a finished product. How do we get to that finished product? Now, it's very easy. Can you imagine poor um, one of those massive movie directors who directed Star Wars, you know, Steven Spielberg, for example. If he spent millions of dollars years and years of his time and energy making something as fabulous as Star Wars or Jaws or one of his massive movies, E.T., and then somebody watches the movie and goes, ah, I didn't like it. That's a lot of work, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours just to be cast aside by somebody's opinion. It's interesting, isn't it? Here's the thing. We don't have a lot of control over somebody else's opinion in life, in business, or in acting. We don't have any control over, over whether you think this piece of artwork here, painted by my mother, is beautiful or not. You might think it's crap. I happen to like it. I think it's beautiful. She's got lots of paintings, but, you know, this is the thing. Art is very personal. Movies are very personal. But when you're in it, you get a completely different understanding of what's happening from the screen. So I thought it might be fun. And please pop below if you think this is fun. I'm going to give you some behind the scenes, things like scripts, memorizations, makeup and hair, rehearsals, shooting techniques, you know, and what I've learned, my life lessons from basically movies. So here we go. Scripts. Let's talk about scripts first. Now, I'm just going to go back for a second just to give you a bit of context to where I'm coming from in this sort of talk today, if you like. As an actor and a singer, I have been in the industry professionally for about, well, longer than I can think. From when I was 11 years old, I had my first paid gig 
in a TV commercial. Now, from there, my very first paid performance on stage was with Mel Gibson. It gives you a little background of, you know, where we started before Mel Gibson was even famous. He had done Mad Max and one other movie, but he wasn't really famous yet. And so we did this silly play on stage with him. Another show that I did was with Nicole Kidman. I've worked with so many different people all the way through my life, but never really made it to the big time and never really got into a commercial big movie. It was always, you know, my life took other turns. So this has been such a beautiful gift to land on my lap. Even though I spent years on stage doing lots of different stage shows, loads of commercials, lots of small TV stuff, this has just been such a beautiful experience. And it's very different to all the other experiences that I've had. So I just wanted to share with that with that with you too, so you could get a little background of the whole thing. Now, scripts. This was super interesting because when I, as an actor on the stage, you get the script well in advance, it's set in stone. And then you learn the whole thing. You go through a six-week rehearsal process or more. With Barnum, when I was doing that, we had to go six weeks of circus training first, then six weeks of learning the show, the choreography, the costume changes, the singing, the harmonies, all of that, before all the opening nights and the previews and things. So that was a big, long rehearsal process. But for this and as I said, I haven't been in a lot of commercial movies. This is my big first commercial movie. I've been in other independent movies. So I can only um, compare it to that. But when in this in this movie with the script, it changed a few times and the names and stuff changed. And so we had to sort of really be on the ball with all those changes and be willing to be flexible with our memories. Now, as a show performer, I learn my stuff way in advance. But with this type of work, and maybe with television it's even faster, you get the scripts and then you learn them as you go. Because what we're really trying to do is you, you can't really cram in an hour and a half or two hours of content from a movie into one brain and then expect to be able to just pull any scene out of your hat and be able to perform it. That would be quite difficult. See, in the context of a play, I was in a very long play once in America called uh, Barefoot in the Park. And when I was playing the mother character in that, we had to learn the entire thing, of course, in entirety. But the easy part about that is that you do that and you run it a million times, not a million, but, you know, at least a couple of hundred times. You're running that consistently in that format. So it's much easier to put that into your muscle memory because you're running it in real time, in the right order, over and over and over again. So you really get to understand the the storyline that you're developing as you go. But with the movie, because we're sort of doing this scene and then this scene and then the scene and it's sort of all over the shop, it's really hard to sort of remember everything like that. So what I found is from learning from the other actors is that instead of trying to cram everything at once, which I tried to do and it was very very bad at doing that because my brain didn't cope. Menopause brain here. I play the mum after all. I am a mum. When I tried to do that, it just didn't work. I just forgot everything. So what I found was really helpful and really useful was just learning a chunk at a time. So what I would do is I would sit into a beautiful location and we were on beautiful locations filming this. It was just stunning. I was sitting on the top of a mountain looking out at the trees and these kookaburras and things would come and sit next to me and magpies want to be fed and the crimson rosellas would swing past and I'd have a glass of wine and I'd look at this gorgeous view and I would run through my lines. Now I did it a couple of ways because I've learned from actors when I was trained if you do it in this particular way it sinks in a little bit better. So if you're an actor please listen up. Number one is, of course, read that chunk of lines that you have to do for the next day over and over and over again as many times as you can. Get the feel and the flow of the words as they're coming out of your mouth because how they speak, that, that character, is going to be different to how you speak, right? So now next, so you have to get used to the flow. Now for me, speaking American was very difficult because I had to think of the shape as well as the flow. So trying to remember everything and put the accent on was, was quite challenging for me, especially with menopause brain. But that was really interesting and I learned a lot from doing the shapes and the resonance. Now next, I was taught this awesome trick. 
Then I wrote down every single word from that part of the script that I wanted to learn. I literally wrote it out in my own handwriting. That I learned a lot too, because then when you're writing it out, you're getting a different type of kinesthetic feel. It gets locked into your body in a different way. And then cherry on the pie is I read that piece. Once I'd gotten it in the correct accent with the correct forward placement, then I put it into my phone and I recorded that on audio. So next what I did over the next couple of hours while I was walking around my hotel or going for a walk or at the gym or something like that, I would listen over and over and over to that particular spoken phrase. That's the way that I did it and I learned that scripting. So that memorization and the scripting is pretty much tied hand in hand. Now, if you're an actor or you've done some acting, I'd love to find out some feedback on how you do it, what the memorization tips and tricks are for you, because that would be brilliant. Now, when I was working with these beautiful people on Christmas Keepsake, Julia Murray and Daniel Lissing are very experienced actors. It was such a joy to be on set with people who are so professional, so into their role and just it was magical to watch. It, it just flowed. They were just so professional. It was incredible. And then they could switch it off and have a chat and giggle and laugh and sit in the corner and hang out with each other. It was just amazing. So me being this is the first time on a, you know, a beautiful movie set like this, it was really lovely to watch from a, a learner's perspective. Yes, I've been in the industry for a very long time. Yes, I had my first professional gig at 11. I'm much older than all of them. I've had lots of life experience, but it's different life experience. It's I've been on thousands of stages worldwide. I've been on thousands of cameras for speaking conferences and things like that. Performance is my home, but this context was different. So it's interesting how just because you're very good at what you do doesn't mean you can move that into a different context and be really good at that too. For example, I want to start a podcast, but I don't really know the ins and outs of starting a podcast. So it's something that I'm going to have to learn. Just like StreamYard, I have to learn that too. So we have to be very open. As we get older, I'm 58 years old, but I'm learning constantly. And I highly recommend that wherever you are in life, don't use your age or your lack of something as an excuse not to learn. Because look, I have other peers in my circle. I'm 58. Most of my friends are in their late 40s, early 50s. And most of my friends, well, not most, some of my friends won't do things on tech. They won't launch an online business. They won't launch a YouTube channel. They won't get on video. They won't get on stage. They won't do all these things because they don't know and they say it's too hard or it's too difficult or I'm not techie. They'll make up all sorts of excuses. So what I love about what I do in life is that I'm learning every single day. I'm building variety into my life and that's what makes life interesting. Who wants to get up and do the same job over and over and over again? That's boring. we got to make all these opportunities for ourselves to do something special in life to make it feel like it's worthwhile you know to make your your life feel like it means something so whatever that is it doesn't matter for you but just put your heart and soul in it so let's go over we just talked about script and memorization a little bit now we're going to do makeup and hair so I don't do my makeup in here now as you can see it just gets all over my face and drives me crazy because I don't have any hairspray here and it's very hot but I was really amazed at the how they set up the makeup trailer. It was, it was fantastic. We had a makeup trailer. So every morning at 5 a.m. we had a makeup call. We would have to go in fresh-faced and clean hair, go in and sit down in the trailer, and Jillian was sitting next to me. Ellie would be the other beautiful little girl, Ellie Stewart. She's about 10, gorgeous girl in this movie. Oh, my God, you've got to watch her. She's just a dream to watch so lovely and natural on screen it's just lovely so we're all sitting there getting our hair and makeup done so they would put you know this specific base and foundation on and then the concealer and then they would do all the the eye makeup it would take them hours and 
hours to get that look that we wanted. And then they would do my hair up in this beautiful little bun. But the interesting thing is that they had to also, also consider today we're shooting in the bakery. Now, the movie or the storyline doesn't go bakery, 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 something else. No, it's the storyline goes, here's the bakery and then there's something else and then here's the bakery again and then there's something else and here's the bakery and there's something else. Now, these bakery days might be a different day. These bakery shots might be the same day. So they had to figure out the continuity. Can you imagine? Oh, my goodness, that would be a hard job, continuity. They had to figure out the continuity of, okay, did my hair do this on the first day in the bakery? If it did, and then this, this scene in the bakery is the same day, but I shot it two weeks later, they had to get all those photos from every different angle to find out exactly how they did my hair and my makeup that day and then make sure they did it again two weeks later on this day when we're back in the bakery for the same day. It was super interesting and, oh, my goodness, what a job that is. Continuity really is important. So that was super cool. The next one is rehearsal. Now, when you're doing a musical theatre or a play, rehearsal time is really, really long. You get six weeks at least or sometimes at the smaller plays you might get two weeks full-time rehearsal. But with this, we've got about five minutes. Seriously. <laughs> it was so quick because the entire movie, an entire one-and-a-half-hour movie was shot in three weeks. It was amazing. The, the precision was like a clock. They had everything figured out from 5 a.m. until 6 p.m. or 8 o'clock at night. They had everything everything figured out, every shot, everything they were going to shoot in that day. It was amazing. So when we got on set, of course, we had to know our, all our lines, all memorised, and then we had to come on all made up, hair ready to go, and then we would all have a little huddle and then talk about, you know, what happens in the scene, who moves where and who goes where, and then we'd sort of run it, just block it, vaguely with the lines and then we'd start to shoot so here's me with my menopause brain going oh my god I have to remember where I stand what I say put my American accent on and then go here and then go there and then duck and then hold this up to the right I was like oh my god this I thought live theater was hard live theater is very hard it's, it, it's a lot of pressure because you have to remember a lot of stuff and when something goes wrong there's a live audience thousands of people watching you messing up and having to cover it up nothing to see here yeah you know, that's sort of fun and interesting but on a movie set you want to get it right because you want to get it in the can looking the best that you can possibly look right you want it to look good you want it to sound good you want it to feel good you want to have the acting has to sit you know and sometimes the interesting thing for me is is this the scenes that i shot that i thought it did a good job and it felt good maybe they couldn't use that take because there was something wrong in in another part of the scene for example the light might not have been good or you know the snow machine was too loud or you know maybe one of the other actors missed a line or something it's like you can't control everything right there's 20 30 40 people involved here so it's not all about you it's a team effort it's so interesting so the rehearsal or a very limited rehearsal really showed me that when you're learning and memorizing your lines in your scripts and you, and really setting into that character you have to be so solid about who you are and what you're there for that you can just have anything thrown at you and you'll still be okay now as a public speaker coach and a voice coach i teach this to my speakers all the time i don't teach acting very much I teach a bit of singing but we can apply this in everyday life when you're doing a, a presentation for work for example with PowerPoint you have to know your content more than you think you need to because shit happens and things might get thrown at you that might throw you off so we have to learn our lines more than we think we need to know them and this applies for so many other things in life as well I hope this is all making sense going to jump over the comments here hey 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 it's nice to see you Chantel hi we're just talking about the movie and behind the scenes stuff at the moment because I thought this just might be fun today instead of my normal presentations next part is shooting technique this was really cool too 
because as I said, I've done a lot of commercials. I've done some feature films, short films, lots of corporate video, things like that. But most of the films have been independent. So it's been a very small cast and crew and it was run in a specific way. But this was super interesting because we had multiple camera cameras on multiple angles. So what made it easier for us as actors, and this was such a relief to find out, is when we're learning the lines and you're trying to get it into muscle memory, trying to remember the accent, trying to remember where you stand, when you come in, what the other actor says, when to nod, all of that sort of stuff. You're trying to learn your actions, if you like, of that scene. Then what we get to do is fantastic. It gives us a little bit of an edge. They shoot, say, a long shot first. So a long shot would be if I was sitting here talking to you on camera and this was my scene, the camera would be all the way across the other side of the room having a long shot of exactly what I'm doing here, sitting, talking to you on camera. That would be the long shot. So I get to prepare. So you're my my other actor. So I'm getting to chat with you and I'm talking and we're doing the scene and the camera over here is capturing that from a long distance shot. So you get to do this at least two or three times to make sure that they've got everything that they need for that long shot, all the words, all the face, all the scenery around you, all of that. Brilliant. Now you've had three more rehearsals. Then they move everybody off set and then they change the camera angle. And then they might put the cam camera, say, you're the star and we're having a conversation. Now the camera goes here, over my shoulder, OTT. So now over the shoulder, they're getting all your facial expressions and your words and your movement with your face, all of that. They're capturing all of it for your close-ups. And then you might do that two or three times, maybe four. Then they'll move that camera from behind my shoulder over to behind the camera, behind your shoulder. Then the camera is over your shoulder. You're delivering all your lines as normal. And as an actor, you have to keep delivering because now you're feeding the lines to me. And if you just say them like blah, 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 how am I going to feel the, res the correct response? You've got to s literally stay in your character the entire time. Because then how good that other actor is at delivering those lines will help you become a better actor on this side to really be in the character and deliver your lines from the best perspective. And then from there, they might talk, take the camera on a side angle like this and capture both people talking. From It's, it's super interesting because so what that did for me as someone new to this particular environment, it was great because it allowed me to go through those lines and through the actions and through the facial expressions and the feeling and all that over and over and over again. So by the time you get to the end of all of those shots, it might be an hour later and you're really sitting in the lines. So that was a super helpful help. If I would known that before I jumped on set, I probably wouldn't have been as nervous. I wouldn't have been a little bit on edge the whole time because I was really concerned about remembering everything at my old age, you know, just as old as the woman we're feeling. No, I am, you know, we worry about holding and, re and retaining information as we get older. It's good for the brain. I'm sure it's very, very good to, um, to slow down Parkinson's or Alzheimer's by having to remember things for sure. Yeah, oh, yeah awesome. It is super interesting. Super interesting how it works. And you'd be brilliant at acting too, Chantel. You're so bright and bubbly. I'd love to see you doing some acting. So what I've learned, what I've learned is be open to opportunities. There are so many times in my career that I could have said no. I could have said no because I was nervous. I could have said no because I thought I might mess up. Could have said no because I didn't think that I could do it or fit it in, you know, and put fill in the blank. I don't have the time to do that, or it costs too much, or you know, it's it's not going to help my career, or it might destroy my career if I do it wrong. You know, most of the time, those decisions, a lot of the time, those decisions are made on fear. There was one time that I was offered an amazing opportunity to open a show for a stadium event of more than 40,000 people. It was a huge opportunity handed to me on a silver platter by somebody that I knew, loved and trusted. I said no. 
Now, all the excuses that I came up with those days, they were logical excuses and they were relevant at the time. But really, when I really think about it from a, a different perspective now, 20 years later as a coach, I realized that those excuses were to keep me safe, to keep me hiding so I didn't get humiliated or say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing or whatever. Because let's face it, when you're on that stage with a microphone, you're it live in front of 20,000 people or 40,000 people, anything can happen. Shit can go wrong. You could say the wrong thing. You could mess up. You could miss a note, whatever it is. You know, so I think really I said no because of fear. So what I've decided, what I decided to do way back then, it was probably 20, 25 years ago now, is I say yes, no matter how scary it is, and I figure it out. And that's what I've done multiple times over the last 20 years, and I have never, ever regretted it. I've learned so much. I've never regretted the decisions to say yes, even if they were scary, even if I thought, I'm not good enough. I don't have what it takes. I said yes, because every time you say yes, you get out of your comfort zone that little bit more. You raise your vibration into belief and trust and inspiration. You raise your vibration to something else. You don't live in fear anymore. You live in pure potential. You live in the realm of possibility. That's where we want to live, in that realm of possibility and pure potential. So I challenge you today, will you be able to say yes when the next opportunity comes up or are you going to let your fear make you say no? That's my challenge I'm going to leave you today. So what I learned, even then the difficult situations through this movie, whenever something arose, that was a little uncomfortable for me, where that trigger came up, I had to ground, I had to breathe, and I had to say yes to myself. I can do this. I've got this. I've got all the tools in my body, in my life, and my mind to deal with this situation. I do because everything you need is already inside you. It just is. It doesn't matter what you think about that. That's just a limiting belief. But everything you need to get through life and succeed is already inside you. You just have to pull it out so you can live from that pure potential. I hope that that helped today. Oh, and I've got one more thing I just want to share with you. Let's go over to the comments. Yes, just say yes and figure out the rest later. I love, love, love that. Rage, thank you. That's so sweet. Thank you. I bought this from. I can't remember where, actually. It was from a, oh, I love supporting artisans. It was a little artisan store in the rocks in Sydney, and it was so cute. The man was sitting behind the counter, and he was selling all his wife's, his wife's handmade jewellery. And he said that he owned that store 40 years ago when she walked in as a tourist who was travelling Australia for one week or something in Sydney, they fell in love and she stayed and started making jewellery in his store and they've been together ever since. It was such a beautiful story. It's like, oh, my God, I'm going to buy it just because I love the story. You know, it was, it was so cute. It was absolutely so cute. Thank you, Chantel. You're so sweet. All right, last but not least, tomorrow is my final webinar of the year. I'm not really calling it a webinar because it's not a webinar. There are no slides. I'm not really preparing any strategic content. It's not, you know, your usual sales webinar. It's none of that. I'm calling it Lose Your Fear of Public Speaking for Good. It's a public speaking masterclass and it's going to go for about 90 minutes. Everyone's going to join me on Zoom with your cameras on. And here's the reason why. When we turn our cameras on, we make a commitment to ourselves to show up and pay attention. It's a commitment. When you turn your camera on, you learn more because now you know people can see you, you're visible, you can be seen and you can be heard. You're going to pay attention. It's very easy to not pay attention with the camera off and your mic on mute. Very, very easy. Now, that said, I know it's possible to pay attention, but I'm just saying I want to challenge everybody to put their camera on if they can. So we've got. I'm going to take you through 
some processes to, to make sure that you can lose your fear of public speaking and you can ground and breathe. Because when we do that, when we lose that fear of public speaking for good, oh, I'm the opposite way, I should go this way. When we lose our fear of public speaking for good, it means that now we can step up to a better life. When we don't have fear, imagine if you don't have fear, what would you do? If you didn't have any limiting beliefs, where would you climb to? What would you attempt? What would you go for in your life? That's where I want to get people. Because if you're living in fear, you're not going to take that next step to skill. You're not going to upskill. If I believe that it's too scary to be an actor, it's too scary to be on a, on a movie, I won't even take photos and go to an audition. I'm never going to get there. So the first thing that I had to do as a kid is really to build confidence and lose my fear. Then I could start saying yes to opportunities that came my way. That's what I've learned. So I'm giving this class absolutely for free for 90 minutes to help you get over those limiting beliefs and get over that fear. Because if you step into that position where you have less fear and you're willing to build confidence and skill, then you can go anywhere in life and do anything that you want. Now, at the end, I will be sharing how to join my monthly membership. But see, the monthly membership is to give you skill sets and confidence and keep growing so you get the transformation that you need. So this is an introductory 90-minute masterclass where I'll be helping you get over your fears so you can say yes to yourself more often. Saying yes gives you more opportunities in life. So we're going to put the link below under all these videos that you're seeing either on Facebook, on LinkedIn, or live on YouTube. We'll put the link below directly to register. All you have to do is click on the link. It takes you to a Zoom page, super simple, nothing fancy. It's just Zoom. And you put your name and your email in to register for free. Now, I'm giving my time for free. Normally, I get paid more than $500 an hour per hour for consultations and for coaching, one-on-one, -on -one, all around the world. So this is absolutely free for anyone who needs help in this area. This is the last time I'm doing it for free this year. And I hope that everybody has a wonderful, wonderful time over Christmas and starts to work on you. You know, just don't just eat turkey until you wobble, wobble, wobble. You know, let's not do that. Let's sit down and really reevaluate our, our lives. What do I want to do? Who do I want to be? What do I want to achieve before I die? How can I do more so I can have less regrets at the end of my life? That's what I like to do over Christmas is to start to reevaluate everything and start to make plans for how I'm going to roll out the very the very next year. And believe me, this year is not over, guys. This year is nowhere near over. It, there's six weeks left of stuff to do. And I have lists of things that I'm going to be doing until New Year's Day. Believe me, I will be busy focusing on who I want to be tomorrow, who I want to be next year, what goals I want to achieve within the next 12 months. I have big goals still, even though I'm older. But, you know, we all can. Do you know the guy who invented Kentucky Fried Chicken? He didn't get his first deal until he was 70 years old. So I've got a good another 10 years to go before I invent my Kentucky Fried Chicken recipe secret sauce. Okay, let's go over to the comments and then I'm going to shut down. You are so welcome. You are so welcome. And I look forward to seeing you in the masterclass. I know you've registered. And Chantelle, it's always a pleasure having you in class. I love working with you. You are such a light, such a joy, and you have so much goodness to share with the world. I know that you'll do really well. All right, have a wonderful, wonderful week and a weekend. If I don't see you on the weekend, I will see all my students at Implementation Day, which is coming up on December 10th. If you're not a student of mine, come tomorrow to the masterclass. If you're in America, it's Friday night for you. For me, it's 7 a.m. Saturday morning in Sydney, Australia time. But you'll see the link below. Register. It's super simple. You'll get a simple reminder. You've got the Zoom link. Everything's there. All you have to do is register and show up for your success. Have a great day. I'll see you then. Bye.